Um, the last speaker of this morning, before we move on to lunch, is a, is a really special treat. It's uh, Dr. Howard Ross from NASA. And uh, Dr. Ross is renowned for his, uh, his, energetic, uh, uh, his energetic presentations and, um, uh, and uh, currently serves as Deputy Chief Scientist at NASA headquarters. Let me just uh, tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he began his career at the Department of Energy in uh, 1976. Uh, he worked at the National Bureau of Standards and came to NASA Lewis Re Research Center in 1985. He was the Chief of Microgravity Combustion Science um, the branch of that from 1989 to 1997 when he became the senior researcher in the microgravity science division at NASA Glenn. Uh, he also served as a principal investigator for a successful flight experiment uh, studying flame spread over liquid fuels um, and uh, a glove box and a glove box experience studying candle flames. Um, he now serves as a deputy chief scientist with responsibility over part of a fairly large portfolio of subjects, which is probably better for me to let him talk about. But uh, I will say that uh, he is really one of the, the best speakers on the, on the subject of the benefits of space exploration, which, as I mentioned during the opening talk, is going to be a major theme during this conference, and I think something that all of us need to think uh, very strongly about. So uh, with that, hopefully uh, the microphone is uh, turned on over there. Uh, hello. Hello. Yep. Great. And I, I will turn it over to you. I'm Dr. Ross. Thanks so much.
you know, do we get any credit for this? Because, boy, I've sure heard it since the day I got to NASA, and I've heard fairly high up people, not to mention names, President Bush, um, said that we, yeah. And, and he said, well, he was very kind, he, and we all know the expression, he said, success says the cross and parents, and you know, we're north, and we're happy to have everybody playing that they were part of, you know, no, you guys really weren't. Um, yeah. And so, so put, that, put that one away. Some of the things we have done, this uh, little barcode in the middle of this uh, printed circuit here, invented by some folks at Mass and Marshall, this actually the same barcode and barcodes that are on, anybody who flew here on your boarding pass across the top, that checkerboard came, came from, uh, from that. This uh, same organization, this uh, group of people that are really worried about telescopes and the jitter from telescopes that come up with this image enhancement system that was used by the FBI uh, in helping to solve the bombing in uh, the Olympic Games and, and, and as well as it's, they, they work with all kinds of uh, law enforcement people and solve, literally solve murders um, through equipment like this and I can go on a long time about you know, some folks I know very well that help the question for the way a person known as the West Side of Rapist at West Side of Cleveland, Ohio they work for NASA for some of this kind of work but um, so let's see if we can keep the one on ahead. It's here. Okay, a couple other things that people tend not to think of NASA about. Uh, a couple people, Bruce Banks and Sharon Miller at NASA Glenn, have been working on atomic oxygen. Everybody here knows the, time, the effects of atomic oxygen that they corrode materials in, in space. So they built the facility. Uh, to, to deal with that so that we could test materials before they ever went to space to see whether they would survive in the space environment. Those, those people realized, boy, if it corrodes away a surface and, um, and has a deleterious effect, they have the classic of turning lemon, lemons into lemonade, they realized that perhaps they could actually eat away a surface profitably, if you will. This painting was damaged in a, in a fire, completely covered in black, all traditional art restoration techniques could not work. Um, they were able to put this basically with atomic oxygen and literally, you know, boil away, if you will, the, the soot from it and get this uh, painting restored. They worked with paintings, whether you like them or not, Andy Warhol, Lichtenstein, other <laughs> paintings. It was great because Bruce told me that when he um, you know, showed this result to the church parishioners and the several who broke down in tears and his first reaction is, my God, what did I do wrong? <laughs> and, and they said, no, they never thought they'd ever, ever see it again. Um, you know, show some of the latency with things. The technique that was developed to make sure people like Mr. Aldrin did not get sick on the way to the moon or back to the food uh, That technique is called the Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. System. It's a seven point system that, that assures the safety of the food. Rather than being reactive and finding out afterwards what went wrong, it's, it's a proactive system that we developed to prevent food poisoning in the first place. Sat dormant for 25 years in 1999, the Food and Drug Administration and the United States Department of Agriculture adopted it for their own, realizing that they needed to, uh, again, not be reactive, but be proactive. Um, the number of cases of salmonella in the country dropped by a factor of two within the first year of adopting this. It's now worldwide, used worldwide, um, both in the food production business and, and elsewhere. Um, while we spend a lot of time looking for life off, off the earth, people don't often think of us, but we're also finding species of, of life on Earth. So there's an extremophile like this found in a lake in California, or looking down from space. The, uh, we, have, we have identified areas where we would suspect there might be new species, and in fact, we have been found in things like chameleons, etc. Um, it, it's, it's kind of wild that I know I certainly don't think of, uh, of NASA when it's not when you want to eat lunch, does that? Okay? So, what can we expect? Um, we'll hear a lot this afternoon from some people if you come to the benefits uh, session. People who are saving lives from some of the, their, their uh, collaboration with us, from uh, people whose lives have been saved as well. Um, I can't wait, just like everybody else, and the people here who are hoping for long-term habitation of the moon or elsewhere, I can't wait for when these aren't the animations and when they're in fact uh, real. Um, well, uh, in the next years, I mean, there are people here, I'm not going to go through all, there are people here who can talk much better than me about mining the moon for you know, platinum group metals or helium-3 or space 
power, or we already heard about uh, you know, the uh, space elevators. So those may come up in, in, in the long run. Because I get called so very often, um, I mean, a week ago, Congressman DeLay, one of our strongest supporters, said, what do you have that you know, has, that has any benefits for, for, for us here? I've got to convince some colleagues. The most famous one, of course, that we've done is remote uh, monitoring of patients, telemedicine. Dr. Ron Merrill is here. And he can, uh, so he'll talk to you a little bit about some of his early work with that, and today his, his work in the bad foods of Ecuador. But since the inception of telemedicine needed to monitor the health of astronauts on the way uh, again to the moon, uh, the death rates in cardiac carrying has fell from 30% to 7%. The, um, today, a single nurse can monitor patients in ways that uh, both more precisely and more patients than, than ever before. Uh, National Institutes of Health uh, frequently acknowledges that. We all know, looking to the future, that we, we can have to deal with the go on to the moon and Mars, the radiation effects, how bad that is. Uh, in low Earth orbit alone, the astronauts on the space station get in a six month stay an exposure equivalent to 300 to 800 x rays in that period of time. The, uh, there are other health effects associated with uh, you know, bone, bone loss, so roughly 10 times the rate of uh, osteoporotic people here on Earth in the time that they're up there. Some problems we're going to have to have to solve, and I'm, I'm actually quite confident we will uh, solve them. We're working with the National Institutes of Health closely. You'll hear some of the, uh, the National Institute of Aging people again this afternoon, testing out all kinds of uh, uh, drugs that you now in the market combined with exercise regimes uh, to solve the, the, the bone problem. This is why I'm very confident we will be able to lift by the time we actually send people to Mars. The other things, there have been a whole raft of experiments, uh, basic science experiments, to make the general difference, uh, about basic science, that have looked at how to encapsulate various materials in miniature ways from nanotechnology techniques. Uh, to a whole range of things, and we've done them on the space station and on the shuttle, and they are translating right now into the practice of pharmaceuticals uh, over time labs in ways that haven't been known before. And I'm confident, again, that this is one of the benefits that uh, we will see from our kinds of inventions. Where will the, when we work on multifunctional materials, that will both be radiation protect, that will protect from radiation, Radiation workers here on Earth will, I have no doubt, uh, benefit from it. One of the great problems with radiation is the uncertainties in the effect. So if we try to predict the damage from radiation, I'm sure that the people here know. There's an uncertainty of 500% either way. It's either five times uh, safer than we're now modeling, or it's five times worse. So it's five times worse the amount of material you would have to block for radiation detection. It's really, it is at least currently cost prohibitive. So we're doing a lot of work to improve the modeling of, of that, as well as you know, we built a facility up in Brookhaven to, uh, to mimic space radiation better than we ever have before. And again, that will translate, I'm quite confident, into uh, improvements here on Earth. Because again, the radiation workers here on Earth, there's a lot of extrapolation that goes on to try to figure out what the appropriate safety measures are. Okay, Robonaut. I'm sure a lot of people are aware of Robonaut as well. The difference between this kind of robot that we're developing now is that most robots you have to design the receiving end, if you will, to be a robot compatible. This is really doing the same, using the same kind of techniques that a person would would have to go pick something, but now the robot uh, will do it. It's having applications uh, right now with uh, pipelines, underwater pipelines. Eventually, these kind of devices. It's not hard to imagine the partnerships that will help people um, who are elderly or disabled. All right, we've got uh, everybody is familiar with the current quarter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> crazy thing is, all that's coming to, to reality. Uh, ultrasound equipment, we've now got the space station commercial ultrasound equipment. We've got uh, Scott Lachewski here this afternoon to talk to you about how that's being modified and being used today in terms of the training techniques and uh, applications into rural environments. There's also techniques we've been developing 
would just simply look into a person's eye and, and get a much better sense of their health. And I'll just take a minute, and you know, this is going to go to all sorts of remote areas, but I want to talk for a minute about this person. This is Rafat Ansari. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Alderman is still here or not, but when Rafat was a nine-year-old in Pakistan, he saw Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon, and at that time, he decided, I, I got to get into that. And you know, he told me, point to someone whose life was changed by a single moment, and quote, to inspire people. It was inspired when he saw um, the, the crew walking on the moon. Well, Rafat was a project scientist on an experiment that flew on the space station. It was a colloid experiment, which is simply particles floating around and self-assembling inside a liquid. There's all sorts of practical applications here on Earth, and that's contained in the paint and milk, et cetera. Well, as he was working on that pure science experiment, his father developed cataracts. Cataracts are simply a collection of particles that have come together in your eye, grown so big, they in fact eventually inhibit your sight. He asked himself, wait, I had some light scattering devices that I built that would, you know, that told me what was happening in my little colloids experiment in space. I wonder if that would be able to detect cataracts in people's eyes here on Earth, and in fact detect them earlier than anything else that was on the market. He began working on it, diverted his career towards it, was able to prove it, co-funded it with the National Eye Institute that they bought in. They highlighted it as a key technology to the Congress for them and working I was really excited about this and bragged to a very close friend of mine, an ophthalmologist, about this great new device to detect cataracts earlier than ever, ever before. His response sort of threw me. He said, who cares? I would never operate on somebody until the cataract grew big enough to inhibit their sight. So I don't need to know anything about it early. Well, so I, of course, was chasing Ran, ran back and said, okay, I better stop talking about this. Um, but the National Eye Institute people informed me that, no, they want to know early detection because they want to be able, instead of surgery, to use to develop drugs that will dissolve a cataract without surgery. And the earlier we know about it, the smaller it is, the less drug we will need, and the better likelihood we will have of, in fact, uh, you know, solving that problem. Well, for five, the, the drug, I mean, this technique is now in clinical trial. Um, he's looked at it, he's modified the device as well to try to do, you know, the holy grail to try to get glucose and correlate with blood glucose. Um, he's even been working with some people at Harvard on uh, detecting Alzheimer's, which now is only detected uh, posthumously, if you will. And so the whole point here is you can now look at therapies, if you will, uh, non-surgically, and that's what the, uh, you know, that's what uh, the National Eye Institute is interested in. Astronauts today between the ages of 55 and 70 have an increased incidence of cataracts of between, of roughly 10 times the general public owed to the radiation exposure they've already received. Three to five times that of military pilots. So we need to know what's going on. So we have our own interests in developing such things. And these, these sort of dual technologies are, are really quite, uh, quite important. Okay, I'm going to switch subjects and I'm going to have to go. I can see a lot faster because we're, we're over lunch and I'm going to jump closer to the end. I saw you and I on your own website, everybody recognized the need for uh, to develop closed loop life support and recycling. Today on the space station, uh, we, re we rely on resupply to keep the crew uh, alive and, uh, and functioning, if you will. Yes, uh, that's something that's going to need to change as we go farther from the, from the Earth. You know, the view from orbit, as we saw this morning, looks like this. And as you go further and further away, you know, you start saying, you know, on your way to the moon, apparently it looks like this. You got then you go to the famous Earth rise from from Apollo 8. Um, but for most of the general public, this is what uh, Mars looks like from here on Earth, and from Mars. You're gonna, this is what the Earth is going to look like. It's really quite different. And you know, this, as Jim Garvin likes to point out, when the when Columbus's crew was out of sight of land, does anybody know how long they were out of sight of land for their whole voyage? 28 days. By the end of that 28 days, they were ready to kill each other. Okay, and that's true. And the same with Magellan's crews. 
there, the, this distance is something that's really quite, uh, quite, quite different than just going to the moon when we're starting to talk about Mars. We're going to have to find to adopt, to adopt the environmental uh, mantra to go. We have to reduce, reuse, and recycle. One of the clever things we've been talking with the uh, Institute of Medicine is to use rapid prototyping that's here on Earth, and that is to literally make your medical equipment as you go. You fly. Draw, you know, CAD drawings, you fly powder and ability to make things, and um, you do it, you know, if you will, on the run. Instead of uh, bringing all the spares, you, you know, you, you make it basically sort of like a just-in-time procurement for people who, who like that. Okay, um, here on Earth, we use, in the United States alone, 50 billion gallons of, of uh, water a day, fresh water a day, we throw it all away. Um, it's one of the most precious resources we have. For the, for the crews that are going to Mars, they're going to have to go to a full recycling system. And I'm confident it's going to come back in terms of the, here on Earth because the scale of, of the spaceship, the number of people involved, is really on the level of a residential uh, home. Here, on Earth, here in the United States, I'm not sure what the benefits will be. We bought in so hard to municipal systems that I don't think uh, it's going to have as big an impact as it's going to have over in the third world. Where, in fact, you, know, you can look at the before and after the, from the tsunami, same region. Um, I've talked with a number of people who believe as we get to these portable water purification systems uh, in a single home or hamlet, uh, the recycling capabilities, it's going to make a huge difference. Okay, I am. Just about out of time. I'm going to actually shut this down. And just finish with one, one story. Um, because I don't, you know, it's now been a few years since we lost the crew of Columbia, and I want to talk just a little bit about some of the things that happened on that mission as, as well as afterwards. And, and normally I can show pictures of the crew, but I'm running so far behind. I don't want to. I don't want to go any, any further. Three, three of the members of that crew, um, Casey, Mike Anderson, and Juan Ramon are the three I want to talk about. There was an experiment on that particular mission called the Water Mist Experiment. It was a fire experiment, fire safety experiment. We all know water puts out fires on Earth. The problem is water, of course, does as much damage as the fire itself often and saturating the site. So there's been a lot of work here on Earth with water mist systems. So you can minimize the amount of water um, to actually put out a fire. The Navy's been working on it, we've been working on it um, as well. Well, some folks in Colorado came up with the idea. What we really need is some fundamental experiment to, to look at that. And simply, and they said, space can get us some answers. We can set up a mist of water and it'll just hang there. It won't, uh, it won't uh, sediment to the bottom of the tube. And then we can put fires through it at various strengths and really understand the interactions and optimize the system. So. They formed a team that involved people from Mexico, from Turkey, uh, university professors, etc. And they flew this experiment on Columbia's last mission. The problem was during the mission, uh, the equipment broke in, in their experiment. And it was exactly like out of the Apollo 13 situation. The group of them on the ground ran around trying to figure out how do we fix the problem, what material is on board that they could use. They figured it out. They had to run to a store to get a bicycle pump to, to see that their solution would actually hold pressure. They were able to prove that uh, to themselves, to their own satisfaction, and write crew procedures to effect the change. Able to get the instructions up to the crew to go try to do the experiment, but then a whole range of, of, of problems occurred. First of all, they'd already used a lot of their timeline, so their timeline was, was gone. And uh, Casey Chala said, gave up one of the most cherished things that happened on these flights, and there she gave up her time to look out the window for half day off. She said, I want to get this particular experiment to work. So she and Mike Anderson worked mightily. were able to get it to work in very little time. They were able to end up getting done 32 of the 34 experiments that have been planned associated with this thing. Data was down length, all the data. You know, we do have all the data from it. Mike Anderson, the day before they were supposed to land, was asked, what was his wow moment in flight? He said it was when we got that water mist experiment to work. Ilan Ramon you know, was supposed to come home right after the flight, and one of the first things he was supposed to do roughly two years ago, about a, about a week ago, 
was participate, because he was Israeli his first astronaut, was to participate in a, uh, a ceremony known as Yom HaShoah, which is a day of remembrance for the people who died during the Holocaust. It's held in synagogues, and, and they light six candles, if you will, one for each of the million people who died, and congregants who, who survivors of the concentration camps come up and will light the, the candle. Um, Ilan was supposed to come up and join actually the largest uh, gathering in the United States and participate in that, which itself was an honor in some sense for the, for the space program to be associated with it. Well, afterwards, that particular congregation decided that what they wanted to do was, and after we lost Ilan, um, what they wanted to do was honor him. And what they ended up doing was, was saying, we're going to light one of the candles in remembrance of the crew of the Columbia, which was a big change from what they, they normally do. The person they asked to light the candle was a person named Sule Gokoklu, who was the project scientist, if you will, that water mist experiment I just talked about. Sule, his religious faith is one of Islam. Okay, I want you to understand, remember what was going on in the world two years ago and what's still going on today, and that is, here you have a Muslim come into a Jewish synagogue with all that was going on in the world, and agree that we need to come together over what over what issue? Over space. And one of the, it's, I talk a lot to people about, hey, what we do in you know, that science is much bigger than what we do in space, and but and the converse is also true. That space is much bigger than science. There is something about space that really does benefit us, not just in the tangible ways that I talked about, but the intangible that bring us all together. And so it's something I hope we'll continue to do, continue to appreciate, and that, and that we will all, private or public, continue to sponsor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ross. That was tremendous. And, uh, and really, uh, really, really, I think, I think, sorry, um, that the, um, the issues uh, that you raise are ones that I hope we can return to over the course of this conference. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to engaging in each of the conference uh, sessions, thinking about the issues of, of benefits and, uh, and related um, issues. So thank you so much for, for your presentation.